Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast, hosted by Dr. Narala Jacobi. Medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice and research as it relates to SIBO and associated conditions. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. Head over to thecebodoctor.com and sign up to the SIBO Mastery Program and take your SIBO knowledge to expert level. If you're a patient, you can sign up to the SIBO Success Plan and beat SIBO for good. Please note, this podcast series is not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. And now... Over to Dr. Jacoby and the latest episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. Welcome to another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Narala Jacoby, and today's topic will dis- discuss circadian rhythms and the influence of um, natural cycles and body clocks on digestion and general health. And my expert today, my guest today is Dr. Laura Brown, who is a naturopathic doctor with a functional medicine approach. She practices um, in Toronto. She's the owner of South End Natural Medicine and the best-selling author of Beyond Digestion. And in her book, she has a chapter on circadian rhythms. So I'm really happy to talk to her today. So welcome, Dr. Laura Brown, to the SIBO Doctor podcast. Really excited to talk about your topic today. Thanks, Narala. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm pretty passionate about this topic. (laughs) Wonderful. So we're talking about circadian rhythms and uh, its influences on the digestive tract or if there are other uh, influences that influence the circadian rhythms. So let's start with just kind of getting everybody on the same page. Um, And talk about circadian rhythms and what does that mean? I think people have sort of a general idea, but it's good to just get the basic information first. Absolutely. And I find even I myself will go back to kind of the basics sometimes just to make sure that I get my my mindset in the the right direction. Um, Circadian comes from the Latin word circa, which means around or approximately a certain time of day. So circadian rhythm, we think a lot in our 24 hour clocks and in our body basically ensure that anything that's going on inside of us is centrally coordinated. Like we have an area in our brain that is called our um, our super chiasmic nucleus, and that's in charge of um, being like our, our central clock, you know, like the grand central station clock. So that is in charge of our circadian rhythm. And um, it's basically a wave, a biological wave or a pattern that's happening around a certain time. And we typically think of things in a 24-hour period. And it really influences all living things, right? It it influences uh, plants and microbes and anything that's alive is sort of responding to the waxing and the waning of daylight, Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's external cues that help us keep on schedule. And these are called zeitgebers um, and includes light, as you mentioned. So our, our light dark cycles, but it also includes uh, temperature um, purification cycles, um, fasting or fed state. So eating windows or fasting times uh, as well as physical activity. So there's many different cues that uh, come in to play. And there's, you know, things like travel that kind of mess it up too. Right. So let's, let's talk about that a little, because I think people are very familiar with jet lag and uh, especially when you're traveling east, eastbound, it seems to be more difficult to adjust to the time than if you're traveling westbound. And I certainly know that because, you know, traveling to and from Australia is, is really a long way. And adjusting to time zones is often time when we experience also more digestive issues, potentially our motility slows down. Uh, we're eating at the wrong time that our body doesn't really know what to do with that. And, and it takes a, f- a few days to adjust to this. So can you talk a bit more about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we already know that sleep disruption alone can predict irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, we know that about 30% of those who work on a 24-hour on-call shift uh, will experience irregular bowel or IBS in digestion or sometimes both. And so the shift work, jet lag, you know, like as you said, eating at different times, because we know that that eating window or the fasting state is part of our cue to, to this rhythm happening. And then also when we talk about travel, we talk about um, like the electromagnetic pull that we have. And, you know, some people think, oh, electromagnetic pull, whatever. But I mean, just think of the birds, right? Like, the, and you, you mentioned like it, this happens in every living organism. How do the birds know when to fly south or when to fly north? You know, how do they know? This is part of their circadian rhythms. So we have rhythms built into us that are part of, you know, electromagnetic connection to the earth. And there's different parts of the earth with that have different types of pulls. And we all experiencing things with um, electromagnetic smog, like too many um, electromagnetic devices out there that are pulling us in different directions. And some people are more sensitive than others. So this also will disrupt our circadian rhythm. And you mentioned um, different Zeitgebers. I'm going to pronounce it the German way because I'm German. Uh, so Zeitgeber is is a German word for time giver. So it's it, it gives the body a sense of time of, uh, I guess, within the circadian rhythm. And you mentioned the purification cycle. And this is something that in naturopathic cycles, uh, circles or in edu our education way back when we learned about Uh, there's a different time when the, for example, the liver detoxifies easier. There's a or or does some dumping. There's also acid dumping at night. Can you talk a little bit about about purification cycles as it relates to the circadian rhythm? Yeah, absolutely. I love that you bring up like the Chinese medicine calendar. Is that what you're referring to, Norelli? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. Like Ayurvedic. It, there's Ayurvedic cycles. There's Chinese medicine cycles, and you know. I think that's been somewhat, uh, or I, I actually don't know how much of that we know from sort of modern science, if that's actually all that accurate. Well, I think there is some accuracy to it. If, if you know, if we're functioning well, you know, we know that these things and rhythms are happening. Um, we know that, you know, one to 3 a.m., if we're waking up at 1 a.m., typically our liver's on overdrive, you know, and what are you doing when you wake up at 1 a.m.? Usually you're making lists of stuff, right? Uh, it's that mind over overdrive, and uh, this is not helpful. Um, and then usually between 1 and 3 p.m., you're tired. It kind of switches, right? So that that's kind of, you know, you know the liver working overtime. The kidneys kind of, I think, is, you know, 3 to, 3 to 5 p.m. or five to 7 p.m. But if it's, you know, if it's switched, you know, if you're waking up at 5 a.m. and things are going on, sometimes it's, you know, irregulation there. Um, people that are waking up at three to 5 a.m., sometimes it's the large intestine. And if that's off, you know, we're thinking of digestive, we're thinking of microbiome. Um, so there's different times that things are happening. So, you know, this is according to like Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic calendars, there was times when different organs would function. And this is what we're talking about with the circadian rhythm and that master clock giving us times of day that things do things. But as you do, drill into like the 2022 latest research, we're, we're able to look at the microbiome and its circadian rhythm because our microbiome, you know, that is not really us, right? It's in us. Um, it's the gut, it's the, it's the bugs or the, the, the viruses, the bacteria, um, that are, that are living in, in our microbiome. Um, and these are helping us digest our food, but they also, as they ferment in the large intestine, as they ferment, um, fibers out of our foods, they make what's called, you know, sometimes termed postbiotics or short, ch short chain fatty acids, or secondary bile acids, but they, they're producing these byproducts, whatever you want to label them, they're producing byproducts. 
from fermenting the fiber in our diet. And these byproducts are responsible for going to different areas in our gastrointestinal tract and turning on genes at different hours of the day. So it's very important that we have a balanced microbiome creating a balance of these byproducts so that the genes are turned on and off. And this is working inherently with our own circadian rhythm. So these bugs in our gut have a circadian rhythm, which is working hand in hand with our own body's circadian rhythm. And if either one is messed up, then th things are just not coordinated properly. And this is where we, we get some of the, the issues, you know, related around digestion, the IBS, the constipation, the diarrhea, um, you know, the, the headaches, the, you know, the, the different things that are happening with regards to, you know, just out of sync uh, waves or circadian rhythms. So um, that's a, that's a really fascinating uh uh, you know, information that, that our, like, we know a lot about the microbiome. We're constantly learning more about it, but that they're intimately linked to somehow our, um, our circadian rhythms. But, and I think the intestinal clock, is it, can it be, can it be, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is when you're saying that bacteria are turning on genes, are we seeing that in people that are either, you know, that have night shifts, that are that have very, very uh, irregular schedules? Are we seeing these um, effects of the microbiome um, more prominently in these people? And and what what are we seeing other than IBS symptoms? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the gut rhythm itself is affected by stress. So anything that instigates stress and shift work is one of those things. Jet lag is one of those things. Anything that affects our circadian rhythm. You know, we talked about the, the light, the temperature, you know, the feeding windows or fasting windows. These things will all affect um, and be part of stress, right? But other parts of stress, um, you know, it's like the old, you know, emotional stress. We always think of stress as being the emotional stuff. It could be too much or too little exercise right? It could be too much or too little food, or it could be infection. So all these things create stress in our bodies. But anything that is stress to the body, the body's now responding to cortisol release. And whether it be from infection or disease, irregular eating patterns, food sensitivities, antibiotics, alcohol, shift work, travel, jet lag, or sleep interruption, all of these contribute to um, to stress in the body or, or levels of cortisol that are dysregulated, which now can lead to like your hyperpermeability or leaky gut. And with cortisol, it's a hormone. Um, if we have too much, it's a problem. If we have too little, it's a problem. It's, you know, it's all, all about that, that balance. And um, those that are, you know, working those shift works, if they're, I guess you could say used to the shift work, and they've created a rhythm that works for their body. And some people do when they do okay with it. I've met people that function better working on night shift. That's just how they are. Um, I think sometimes the challenge is, is when they keep shifting the shifts. You're working days, you're working nights. Now, if you're working days for you know, a you know, two to four weeks and then working nights for a period, I think there's an opportunity to have the body, you know, work back and forth. But it's finding that regular regularity in the irregularity. So if you're if you can flow with that, some people flow with it much better. But if your body takes that as a um, as a stressor, then it's then it's going to show up, right? It's going to show up. But it, it, inevitably, we're seeing more instances of IBS. You know, in thirty percent of the population who work shift work, they're going to have IBS. That's I, yeah, that's what we're seeing. I definitely see that in my practice, and I think most people that are in practice would would um, agree with that. That people that are on very fluctuating schedules of night shift, day shift, night shift, uh, we're seeing it's just it's just really much harder to um, control their their digestive symptoms and also their sleep symptoms and their stress symptoms and 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 all of that. And I was reading this um, good book. Um, 
gosh, I can't remember his name now, but uh, Why We Sleep. I'm sure you've heard of this book. This is uh, a recent book that's come out and he talks about the night owls and the morning larks, I think he called them. And and like 40% of us are morning people and 30% of us are actually night owls and that's just our natural rhythm. So maybe it's those people that just um, just tend to fare better with shift work or night shifts uh, specifically. But we do have a lot of research with shift work and its effect on uh, immunity and so forth. And um, just one word about the the, melo- the uh, cortisol uh, is is in such uh, sync with melatonin also, right? So as uh, we, I often think of cortisol as sort of the daytime hormone and melatonin more the sleep regulator that comes on at dusk. And there's this very fine balance between uh, as cortisol drops, that's the signal for melatonin to rise. And then um, also as the sun rises, we see the the reverse happening. So there is a natural balance between daytime and nighttime. Can you talk more about, you know, uh, sort of nighttime symptoms of digestive imbalance that are due to circadian dysrhythmic, dysrhythmic cycles? Or like, you know, are there nighttime symptoms? Because I see a lot of people that say they are woken up at night with a lot of gas, with um, heart race, uh, heart racing, and they really tie it to their digestive tract. Have you observed that as well? I have, and I find different uh, root causes behind some of that. Um, so vitamin D comes into play here too, because vitamin D works at the same time cortisol does. It's kind of works with the sunshine, right? And then the melatonin side of it, but people waking up at night, the heart racing, um, often food sensitivities. Okay. And, um, can be alcohol related, burning off the alcohol can also be sugar related eating that last meal too late. And now the body's busy trying to, you know, it's going, well, here's the energy you just, you know, took in and you're, you know, cause we eat for energy and, um, it's thinking, oh, well, let me just give that to you right now. And really, we need to put it into storage for releasing it more slowly. But if we're not getting enough fiber in our diet, then sometimes it gets released too quickly. Um, if we have insulin dysregulation, then it's not getting really, you know, it's not getting stored and released. If we have liver issues, right? Um, our liver is responsible for making or pulling sugar from the storage. And if, if our liver is not healthy, then it can't pull sugar from the storage. Um, If we've had alcohol, and one thing I learned, and maybe maybe you knew this, um, but it was new new to me when I read it, that alcohol actually um, impairs the liver, it stops the liver from being able to put that blood sugar, like to make the sugar to put out into the bloodstream should the sugar be dropping. So if you have, if you're drinking in excess or, you know, usually if you have like half a glass of wine with dinner, it's not the end of the world. You usually digest that it's fine. But if you drink alcohol in a fasted state, or if you drink too much alcohol, um, your liver, you know, its hands are literally tied for up to 12 hours. It can't give you any more blood sugar. So that's usually where you get the sugar crash, craving more food. And this sometimes happens with people waking up in the middle of the night craving food because their liver can't give them the blood sugar that it needs to keep the blood sugar balanced. And is that making sense? Yeah. So that's kind of, yeah. So that sometimes is waking people up. So liver, you know, liver issues, um, food sensitivities. I've had people, you know, just, you know, we do the elimination diet or we, we do some, you know, food intolerance tests. And when we get the foods that are bothering them out of the diet, now, you know, the gas, the pain, the bloating, things like that um, aren't happening. And it's kind of, it was kind of interesting with a couple of patients, how they would, it would be at the exact same time of day that, you know, this, you know, the symptoms would come up or same time at night. And then it was getting these things out of the diet. Then things seem to improve much better. So balancing that microbiome, not putting things in there that are irritating, um, and histamine, right? Like histo- I mean, I see very often a uh, histamine problem, but I guess what I was, I was wondering is if the microbiome is so susceptible to circadian rhythms, are there, you know, just like we said, there's, there's a liver time. 
is there also like a microbiome time or is there is there is that just uh, ba- in the background of what else is going on if we have an intestinal clock how do we know that our intestinal clock is disrupted or is that just part of the bigger circadian rhythm that's a that's a really really good question i don't think we specifically have that answer and the microbiome is starting to be considered an organ right of its own um, we, you know, we have the hours of the day for like the spleen, the stomach, the liver, the large intestine, the small intestine, but all of these are part of digestion, right? They're all part of digestion processes. So, you know, looking at that Chinese medicine calendar, we may be able to discern, oh, well, maybe something's up in the small intestine. Maybe it's more small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If we're getting something, I got my little calendar here. I'm going to have to have a peek, make sure I get it right. So, you know, small intestine, you know, one, you know, 11 to uh, to one or one to three. Uh, so one to 3 p.m., which would mean, you know, maybe it's off if, you know, maybe it's the liver and the small intestine um, be, between one and 3 AM if something's up. So it's something to pay attention to. Um, and then I know there's some homeopathic clocks as well. I've got a really great resource that, um, I don't know if you use homeopathics in your practice. I do. Yeah. Um, but I've got this great resource and they've, they've said, okay, if you have issues between like 12 and one or one and two, you know, these types of rem, you know, these remedies are, are helpful. And, and, you know, I've experimented with that and, and, you know, just said, well, let's just try this during that time. And sometimes it's really helpful for the individual. So, you know, sometimes there's, you know, a specific vibration, you know, which would be a homeopathic um, that would help just reset what's going on. So it's something to take into mind. I don't think we have some, you know, firm, firm things, but as naturopathic doctors, we can look at that Chinese medicine calendar. We can look at the homeopathic clocks and, you know, you know, and, and obviously it's individualized medicine. So we're like, okay, what's going on? What could it be? So pulling all those, you know, pulling the loose, loose strings and just seeing what unravels from that. And just uh, for the listener, if your symptoms are not during that time, doesn't mean you don't have SIBO or that you don't have different things. It's just that we're talking about this very specific time uh, timed event of circadian rhythms, but we, you know, we have lots of different influences on our digestion. Um, but I just wondered if there are specific uh, symptoms or times that really indicate that this is because of sleep deprivation, or this is because the circadian clock is all messed up. You know, what are some of the key symptoms that we can expect as practitioners? Well, I think we look at like a healthy biorhythm. I think that is a good place to start. Like, what does this person's biorhythm look like? And then, uh, you know, as we're doing our intake, you know, I'm typically asking, okay, let's, what, what time, what time do you go to bed at night? Okay. How, you know, how long does it take you to fall asleep? How many times waking up through the night? What's waking you up through the night and going through that whole sleep hygiene to figure out because that's multi pronged, right? And then are we, are we rising naturally or to an alarm? When we're rising, are we rising rested? Do we feel fully rested when we rise? Um, what time, you know, are we are we going to the bathroom? Are we urinating through the night? If so, how many times? What time of our, are our bowels moving? Are they moving regularly, you know, each morning, once a day, easy to pass? Or is it three times a day? Is it multiple times? Is it right after we eat? So the, that bowel regularity is something else to, to watch for. Um, and this can give us clues to, you know, health of the gallbladder, um, you, you know, health of the health of the large intestine, food sensitivities, uh, things like that, that, that can help us hydration status. There's so many different parts of it, you know, and then what time are we eating? How, you know, how, how long are we fasting? Right. Cause that digestive break is so critical for our immune function and for things to happen. Our rest is not. Um, inactive. I always say sleep is such an active state. So finding out, you know, and then what time are they going to work? What time are they coming home? Just finding out what their natural rhythms are. What time are they exercising? And then 
is there some, you know, synchronicity to it? Is it, is it flowing? Is there a flow to it or is it different every day? And if it's different all the time, then obviously we're, you know, something's out of order and we could do testing like cortisol testing, right? We can do the salivary cortisol testing, dried urine cortisol testing and compare those and see, you know, what our cortisol awakening response is, you know, our initial drive in the morning, does it kind of, you know, fall down a little bit? And then do we get a little peak, you know, mid afternoon? And then does it fall a little bit more? How's our melatonin? Where's that at? So, you know, we can look at different levels of hormones and just see how the rise and fall or things are and where our vitamin D status is at, because that's critically important too, to the biorhythm. There's so many things that play into it. There's not just a few little items. We're also looking for, you know, fiber and diet and things like that. So we can get these, you know, in the balance of the microbiome so we can see what's happening, but it's really looking at that flow in the daily rhythm for the individual. And that kind of brings it back to the shift work and stuff. Even if they're on shift work, do they have a rhythm that is similar day to day? And is there biological functions, you know, happening around a 24 hour clock regularly? You know, I just, as you were talking, I was thinking about this latest trend of intermittent fasting or timed eating where people are eating between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. or so just to uh, regulate their weight and their, I mean, for various reasons. Uh, what do you, what, what influence does that have? Or what do you think about how that will influence our circadian rhythms and our intestinal clocks? Uh, often it helps reset right? If you have issues, often having a fasting state, at least 12 hours will help start to reset things. But you, you know, if you extend it and I mean, fasting is not right for everybody, but you know, there are, and there's no one right way to fast. There's so many different ways to fast. Um, key thing is to always be hydrated um, while you're fasting. And if you're, you're pregnant or if you have, you know, you're not going to fast, if you have type, you know, if you have diabetes, you're going to be monitored. You don't want to do that without being monitored. Um, but as far as the other, it, it resets so many things. It re, you know, it helps with cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance. It helps with immunity. It helps with, oh, I've got my whole list here. Um, it helps with the digestive tract rhythm. So yes, it does that. Um, stabilizes body weight, reduces fat. Um, lowers blood pressure, lowers blood glucose, lowers cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, it, it, it does so much for us when we fast. So it, it's, it's critically important that we do have a fasting state. And typically, you know, we, it, that's overnight, right? Seven to seven for most is, is time for fast, but you could extend it. Um, if things are out of balance and you would extend it until things come back into balance. Uh, sometimes that digestive rest is necessary for the body to do the other functions. Cause you have to think when we eat, that's a huge manufacturing process and, it's, and it, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of motility. It takes a lot of digestive enzymes and things going on. And, and then we have to digest it all, right? Like we have to go through, break it down, absorb it, you know, things that we didn't do that in the small intestine go down a little further and now we're fermenting it. Great. Um, this is very, you know, this involves a lot. And then we have to eliminate whether it's through, you know, urine or through stool. So th there's a lot. So when we're not eating, it's giving, you know, it's giving what happens in that digestive tract a chance to do all of those immune functions, right? It's over 70% of our immune systems in our gut. So yeah, this is important. So fasting, um, will really do, you know, really does help, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the, the trendy stuff or just like the old fashioned, you know, don't eat after dinner and don't eat till breakfast the next morning. We're big fans of, uh, of fasting, uh, naturopathic doctors. Um, and you know, with, uh, in my practice, when I see very severe, uh, IBD, for example, or any kind of acute flare up a, a, a water fast for 24 hours or so can often be very helpful. But obviously that caveat, if you're very underweight or if you have issues, you really don't want, you want to be under the care of a, um, ideally a naturopathic physician or functional, uh, medical doctor just to um, monitor your health and well-being during that process. But it is a really helpful um, uh, thing to do some, some timed eating or fasting. So I agree with that. There is just some, some 
potential fad stuff of you know the the time uh, of eating of when that time should occur and i just wondered if you knew if that was related to um the circadian rhythms and what happens with digestion and what happens to maximize when food arrives yeah absolutely and i think that's individual i think it depends on the current state of the individual um what might work best for them um, as you just mentioned, you know, those with IBD, I think of those with insulin resistance, um, fasting and a healthy diet can often reverse, you know, type two diabetes, what that fasting state looks like, um, will be, you know, based on what's going on, what the person's able to do, willing to do that type of thing. Well, this is really interesting. So, um, and I always love getting the in conversation back to specifically the microbiome. So do we, are we at that point in research where we know what phyla or groups of bacteria are most affected by Im- imbalanced circadian rhythms? I don't think we have that level of detail. We do know, you know, there's no one perfect microbiome. So we, we don't even know, you know, what the perfect microbiome looks like. We know what generally you know, the six or seven families of bacteria that comprise a healthy, you know, in healthy individuals or individuals without a lot of health issues, so to speak, you know, what that looks like. We've identified, you know, you know, things that probably, you know, shouldn't be in there. We have identified things that, you know, can be in there if in small numbers, but if they get, you know, too many of them, then they start to, you know, cause issues. And it really comes down to, what are these bacteria making? Are they making toxins, right? Lipopolysaccharides, because, you know, a little bit of lipopolysaccharide is really helpful to stimulate REM sleep or deep sleep. But if you get too much of lipopolysaccharides, now that's a toxin. And, and now, you know, that has potential if you, you know, have irritated your gut lining and and that's getting out into your bloodstream. That's going to cause inflammation and all sorts of diseases, um, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, you know, joint pain, headaches, you name it. Um, we also know that, so, you know, so the lipopolysaccharides, but then, um, you know, that's usually your gram negative bacteria, but then we have those healthy families. And I mentioned before, as they're, they're fermenting the fiber in our diet, they um they make short chain fatty acids they make um some tryptophan metabolite type things and then they'll they'll make um secondary bile acids and the short chain fatty acids and the secondary bile acids um some people are terming them as postbiotics so these postbiotics you know the balance of of those things because there's different types the balance of those are critical to helping turn different genes on and off in our gastrointestinal tract that helps with our rhythms, that helps with things happening. And they've linked this to depression. They've linked this to anxiety, you know, these imbalances, you know, so we do see that. And we see, you know, in the gut microbiome um, comprehensive stool analysis that we're doing, you know, some, some types of bacteria, even the healthy ones, if we have too much of this one, not enough of the other one, these, you know, too much of this is seen in, in inflammatory bowel disease, you know, so if you see a lot of that, you know, across the trends in, in somebody's gut going, oh, well, it's kind of leaning more towards an inflammatory bowel disease, you know, let's reel this in, um, you know, and helping reset. And we know so much affects the microbiome, our food, our meal timing, what we eat, how we grew up, you know, how, you know, you know, whether we were breastfed or not, um, there's so much that goes on, you know, the plastics in our diet, the food packaging, it's, it's, it, you know, the toxins from um, pesticides, insecticides, you know, off-gassing chemicals, lotions and potions we put on our body and clean our house with all of these things affect our microbiome um, drugs, you know, drugs we take, even, you know, specific drugs uh, not just antibiotics, but drugs that act like antibiotics. These things um, affect our microbiome and even just taking five or more drugs is going to shift because the microbiome will shift in order to help um, eliminate the um, and break down those drugs. So there's so much, so much and so many things happening. So we don't have, it's a, you know, as you can tell, it was a long answer to your question, but um, it's a moving target. It's definitely an evolving field. I I agree. And, and I have been really fascinated with, um, 
I, I don't really like the term postbiotic, but it is the term postbiotics, but um, metabolites. And uh, besides short chain fatty acids we, and the um, IPA that you mentioned, or the tryptophan metabolite, uh, we also have neurotransmitters, right? Certain neurotransmitters that, are, that can be affected and produced. And we have um, things like ammonia and we have things like histamine and hydrogen sulfide production and all these different substances that we're just beginning to, well, maybe not beginning, but we're in the process of really understanding that. But you mentioned specifically short chain fatty acids, um, of which there are three that we typically get reported on, which is the acetate and the propionate and the butyrate. Um, have you seen anything that's specific to either, to, to any of those that when you talk about gene uh, turning genes on or off, is is there anything specific to any of those metabolites or short-chain fatty acids that um, are as part of this conversation of the circadian rhythms? I'm just trying to think if anything's tying back to, to a, you know, affecting that. Because it's typically butyrate, right? Like butyrate is is usually the one that that uh, gets most of the limelight because of its effect on motility and inflammatory mitigation and and things like that. But I hadn't heard of this uh, turning on genes that relate to uh, to to the intestinal clock. Yeah, and it's turning on genes for different purposes in in what's going on. Um, and sending those messages up to the brain. And, and I'm just trying to think, because what keeps popping in my mind is valerate, valerate which is one of the um, short chain fatty acids and an imbalance in that linked to Alzheimer's disease, but there's finding so many different things linked to Alzheimer's disease. Um, then we're, we're looking at, like, I'm, I'm not, I can't think of anything right now that, you know, specifically okay. is turning on a gene that's changing something in the circadian rhythm um, but you're right. Like there's so many other things that the gut microbiome is making. Um, it's making, you know, some vitamins it's, it's, um, helping us absorb stuff. It's making neurotransmitters, um, which is, um, you know, like GABA serotonin, that type of thing. And we know the gut itself makes 400 times more melatonin than the brain. Um, 90% of our serotonin is made in our gut. So you have to think if the gut's off, um, these types of things, you know, will affect now the melatonin made in our brain and our pineal gland is typically what's used to, you know, is that dark light, right? Dark, like dark light responsive. The melatonin in our gut is not dark light responsive at all. And I think we make so much of it there because it's used to help, um, the gut cells heal and turn over because we're turning over those gut cells every three to five days, which is high turnover. So it needs something to help keep things in check. And I think the melatonin is used a lot um, there for that is my um, my sense from what I'm reading. Yeah. And I, um, I think it's also to some extent involved in uh, motility of certain, as of certain organs, of certain aspects of organs like um, bile flow in the gallbladder and, and those kinds of really obscure uh, things. I remember uh, SSL talking about that in one of his uh, lectures about the about the gallbladder, that melatonin is really important for that, as well as like the uh, lower esophageal sphincter and motility in the stomach. So melatonin turns out to be like this little, uh, little you know, powerhouse of of a uh, nutrient that that we're making. So I hadn't really heard that about the microbiome making you know a, a magnitude of I don't know how much of more, but uh, way more than the brain. So that's new information. That's great. Um, now, can we talk about what, what can people do? They're identifying with this. They're saying, okay, um, I may have a circadian imbalance. I, I don't sleep well at night. It may not be jet lag. It may not be shift work, but I'm just not getting, uh, I get very disrupted sleep and then I'm drowsy during the day. And that does affect, as we've just learned, uh, the different aspects of digestion as well. And sometimes people think it's the digestion that comes first. Uh, and then the sleep second, but sometimes it's the other way around. So I just wondered, what are your go-to recommendations to reset an internal clock? Well, fasting fasting is important. Um, getting a good night's sleep and going through the sleep hygiene is important. And then having 
you know, regular rhythms of things, getting up at the same time every day, going to bed at the same time every day, exercising at the same time every day, eating at the same time every day, and just doing those very simple things day in and day out. And it's very boring to our brain for the most part, but it's very helpful for the body because now it it, it doesn't have to think. And you have to um, visualize what you do for a child. Isn't this, you know, what mothers do often with their children to keep them in a happy state, right? In a calm state is to have their regular routines and rhythms and the child will naturally establish it, but you have to encourage it as well. But you get these routines going and then things are so much simpler for them. So much simpler because the body just kind of anticipates what needs to happen. So you got to set things up for success and um, and have some established routines in place so that things are, are, are common for the eating, sleeping, exercise. Um, Elimination. Day in, day I, yeah, I often... Yeah. I often tell people just go to the bathroom anyways, sit on the toilet, just to kind of establish a, a a routine. Just even if nothing is moving, it's important to set aside time for that, just to sit on the toilet and and maybe something will happen. Uh, but maybe just by provide giving the body some time. The other thing I would add to your list is exposure to sunlight and to make a to make a specific uh point of that to sit in the sun for maybe even five minutes in the morning so that we actually get some um, some exposure to UV rad- radiation that has some beneficial effect for resetting our our clocks as well. Yeah, that's a really, really good one, that that early morning exposure to, to natural light, or even if you don't have natural light, to, to have the, um, the 10,000 lux lamps. Those are super helpful, right, to have just that exposure. Can you talk more about those? Because I we live in Australia. We get basically, it feels like sometimes 24 hours of sun. <laughs> you know, we get a lot of sun here. So we don't have we, we don't have a problem with, with sun exposure. But um in you know, people that are listening that l- maybe live in Northern Europe or live in Canada, live um maybe north, what is it, uh, north of the Arctic Circle. Um can, like what are you guys doing up there? Yeah, yeah. Especially, yes, yeah, because because I mean. I'm I'm in Canada, so um, I'm I'm sitting, you know, in the Toronto region. I'm outside of Toronto, but um, so in the in that area. But you know, I think of my friends in Iceland or Scotland or places like that. Are you talking about your you know your heritage, Germany? Um, our winters, like November, you know, October, November until you know this time of year, it's pretty dark. Um, you know, we're, we're not getting that many hours of daylight that the sun might be coming up at eight o'clock in the morning for me. And by four o'clock, you know, it's already gone down and this makes for, you know, you know, difficulty sometimes regulating your rhythm. So I usually suggest they call them happy lights or, um, but it's a 10,000 lux light, um, full spectrum light daylight that you, you don't stare into it. You just kind of put it to the side while you're having a cup of tea or put it to the side while you're working on the computer, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you know, you could do that. You could do it again at noon. Sometimes you will find it helpful, but that exposure, you know, helps the natural rhythms of, you know, the cortisol, the melatonin kind of, kind of, you know, balance that, that circadian rhythm to, to regulate. So now this helps us know when night is and know when day is. So we don't get, you know, cause, cause that itself can start disrupting us. Um, and disrupting, you know, you just always feel like you're in a gray fog. You're kind of asleep through the day, kind of asleep or kind of awake through the night. And there's, there's just no contrast, right? You need the contrast. We need day. We need night. Is that yin yang? You know, we need the, we need the contrast. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. This has been really interesting. Um, before we wrap things up, uh, where, A, where can people find you? And B, any, any last minute nuggets in terms of, Uh, our topic today? Um, I mean, there's always nuggets. There's always things that I'm like, oh, geez, I wish I put that in there. Um, I talk a lot about this. I have a whole chapter in my book, Beyond Digestion. Um, That's available on Amazon worldwide. So easy to pick up. It's an easy to read um, book. It's easy to digest, so to speak, people tell me. But I do have a whole chapter on circadian rhythms and and just how how things in the body works on waves. 
And so that's something that might be helpful if people are interested in learning more. Um, my website is, um, I think you're going to put the link there. It's yeah, in the show notes. End, mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be in the show notes. South End Guelph. That's kind of spelled funny. Dot uh, ca. So that's there. Um, I do lots of blogging, so there's information there. And if you send me a link to the podcast, usually I do a little blog and then and then put a link to the podcast there, so that um, people can can see it from there. So I've done other podcasts around the world with people on you know mostly on gut health because I'm pretty passionate about it. Um, but yeah, if you take care of your gut, really, it'll take care of you. It is so critical and such a um, just such a heavy hitter when it comes to good health. Mm, couldn't agree more. Thanks so much for your time, Laura. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Neral. I really appreciate connecting. It's been a pleasure. To access the biphasic diet and the SIBO success plan, or if you're a practitioner and would like to become an affiliate, go to thecebodoctor.com. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor podcast. We hope you find the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering. Thanks again for listening.